First, I'd like to thank you all for your kind words. I thought I would be able just to push through and slip back into the daily routine, but that was a little bit far-fetched. And so I kind of got run down and wasn't able to function anymore. Um, my mother and father are okay. Mum deteriorated quite a bit while I was away. There was some issue with her heart, but it looks like we're back on track. So I wanted to um, post a video about something I'd seen on YouTube. As you know, uh, since I came out of retreat, then I've been trying to catch up on what's going on in the Western world regarding spirituality. I mean, for 12 years, then my education has primarily been in the Tibetan language and in, in retreat. So I'm kind of unaware of what's going on in the West. And so I've been looking at social media, etc., to find out what people are practicing and uh, where we are. And I was surprised by a few things. For example, this phenomena of celebrity awakening, etc. And uh, to me, it seemed to be a kind of like spiritual revival or spiritual craze, like the one that happened in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, something that probably wasn't stable. So the other day, I was looking into some fairly well-known non-dual teachers. And there was this podcast that had three non-dual teachers on it. And I thought I would have a listen to that because it would be a good opportunity to kind of see what their natural and uncontrived view is. You know, when people kind of post videos for their own communities or within an organization, let's say like Rupert Spear, for example, then they kind of tidy it up and want to present it in a particular way. But when three teachers come together and have a casual discussion, then you're likely to get a kind of uncontrived and natural view, what they really believe, what they spontaneously say, and not something that's been made to look nice or edited. And when the introduction came on, I was quite surprised, because the introducer had said of one of these three teachers that, well, they're going to retire soon, like in a few weeks, they're going to retire from spiritual teaching. And to me, this sounded very strange sounded very odd. Now, I'm not exactly sure what he means by retire. Maybe he means he's going to leave aside teaching, uh, this sort of formal spiritual teaching, and instead focus on his own meditation. That is possible. I wouldn't say that's a valid reason, but that is possible. It's possible as well that he's just going to leave aside public teachings and going to continue on with his own very close students. It's kind of entourage. Now, Many people will be familiar with Akron Rinpoche, and Akron Rinpoche did say that he'd kind of retired. But what he meant by that was that he would no longer be in charge of the monastery at Samuling, you know, do the day-to-day -day work. In the end, actually, even though he did retire, he was still the boss, and he still made all the major decisions. I mean, I saw him myself on the construction site, supervising everything many times. But he didn't retire from his spiritual teaching, and he didn't retire from his humanitarian work. In fact, right up until the day he died, he was deeply involved in work with Rokpa, in the sort of uh, infrastructure and education and humanitarian aid for underprivileged people all around the world, Tibet and Africa and all these kind of third world countries. And especially, Akron Rinpoche never gave up his spiritual teaching. In fact, before he went to Tibet, when he died, then he visited us in the retreat and he gave us a lot of very important spiritual advice. He continued to act as a spiritual teacher for his students worldwide, but also continued engaged in his humanitarian activities around the world. And he was, he was not young, he was in his 80s. He was, I think he had his 80th birthday just before then. I can't remember the exact date. You know, it was about 11 years ago or something. So when I heard that this uh, Western spiritual teacher was going to retire, I thought it would be nice to kind of put this in the context of other spiritual teachers. So if we look at some kind of fairly modern uh, Buddhist teachers, for example, well, there's one who is Kempo Jigmi Punso Rinpoche, I've mentioned before. This was one of my own Lama's teachers. And he was responsible for founding Seta Larunga. That's not Sekar, but Seta Larunga. And this is in Eastern Tibet, in Kham region. It's very famous. Uh, it has been mentioned by the Karmapa. 
as one of the seats of Dharma that has basically saved the Buddha Dharma from complete destruction by the Chinese. And it's a massive Dharma encampment. I think now there's probably more than 20,000 people there practicing. And what they do day in, day out is they listen to Dharma teachings, they meditate, they study, they're just completely involved in the spiritual path on a very profound level. And there's some really amazing, really learned and also experienced teachers there, like hundreds of them, in fact, from all kinds of nationalities. This was all down to this one teacher, Jigme Putso Rinpoche. Now, how did he retire? Well, he didn't. He kept teaching right up until he was on his deathbed. In fact, he taught from his deathbed. So famously, Jigme Putso Rinpoche became ill at the end of his life. And you know what he did for his life? He basically, you know, he gained realization and then he just taught the Dharma day in, day out. In fact, when the Chinese stuck him into prison and they were torturing all these lamas, they still had teaching sessions in the cells, even though this was very, very dangerous. Because it was not only illegal to teach the Dharma in China at that time, but you could be executed for it, and many lamas were. So secretly, in private, in their dark dungeon cells in Tibet, being oppressed by the Chinese, then this incredible Lama and Kempo and Rinpoche, this uh, reincarnate Lama, this Tulku, would continue teaching the Dharma in these terrible, terrible conditions. And then when things improved in Tibet and it, people were allowed to be monks outwardly and they were allowed to continue to study and practice the Dharma, then he founded this Dharma encampment called Seta. And it's on top of a very high mountain in the wilderness sort of isolated, desolate place, and it was chosen because it's somewhere where they could get on with their, what they loved, their Dharma activities, without being bothered by the authorities. And they did this for years, and it grew from a very, very small encampment of a few huts in the middle of nowhere, and to this day, now it's become the most impressive, the most diverse and widespread Dharma encampment in all of Tibet, and all of the world possibly. It's probably the biggest thing of its type in the world, in any tradition, Christian, Hindu, whatever. Uh, of course, the Hindus uh, supersede this in their kind of temporary uh, gatherings because they have the most massive uh, kind of gatherings of spiritual practitioners for one-offs, kind of like special uh, pujas or holidays. And they're very impressive. I mean, they say there's something like maybe a million people show up. But these are permanent encampments like Setar. Setar is a place where people actually live. And it survives even though the Chinese have tried to destroy it. And, you know, uh, there's other places in Tibet as well, similar to that, but Setar is the biggest one. So Jigme Putso Rinpoche, then when he became too ill to actually sit on a you know, Dharma throne and teach in front of the people, then he would lie down in his sick bed and then he would give Dharma teachings over the telephone and that would be broadcast to the audience who were in, you know, the devotees who were at Setar. And it was the same. Once he was on his deathbed, then he continued to teach right up until the last moment. And it's not only Jigme Putso Rinpoche, it's also this uh, very famous uh, teacher called Kempo Chukyap. And Kempo Chukyap is famously called the sort of Milarepa of the modern age. It's quite an amazing character. And he lived in a small Dharma encampment near Setar, in a little wooden hut. And he sat there and he taught for decades. And when he came to the end of his life, he was very sick. He continued to teach. Uh, you know, he would go to the Dharma hall and he would continue to teach. And his students were so afraid because he'd become very, very ill. And so they begged him to have a break. But Kempo Chukyap would never do that. As long as he was alive and he was able to benefit others, then he was going to teach until his last breath. And then, as the story goes, his students tricked him. They kind of lied to the Lama. They said, well, we need a bit of a break. We would like to do a few pujas. So a puja is like this sort of ceremonial kind of chanting and banging drums and worshipping deities type thing. And they make a feast offering. So they make some kind of food and they offer it in the ceremony and everybody shares it. It's kind of called a tzok offering in Tibetan, or a puja in the Hindu tradition. And, and so they tricked the Lama, and they said they wanted to do a few days of puja. 
to have a kind of break. And so he accepted it. He said, oh, okay, that's fine. Because it's a virtuous thing, right? He accepted it because they were still wanting to engage in some kind of uh, spiritually virtuous practice. And so he allowed them to do these few days. And realistically, then they would only have a few days off an entire year. Maybe New Year they would have off a few days here and there. But other than that, it was continuous teaching day and night. I mean, up until then, he got really sick. He had tuberculosis or something. He was like coughing up blood while he was teaching. They got really afraid. And then they tricked the Lama and they said, oh, let us do a few days of puja. And they did this in the hope that Kipo Chukyap would have a bit of rest because he was looking really ill. And then they did their few days of puja and the Lama passed away, passed into Nirvana. So basically he was so ill that he died soon after he stopped teaching. It was just teaching that kept him alive. And so he just kept going. This is not rare in any way. This is the way the Tibetan Lamas see things. Basically, the way they see it is, as long as you're alive and you're able to keep teaching the Dharma, then whatever you've learned, whatever realization you've come to, then you must share with your students. Because basically, it's a rare opportunity in their life to meet a Lama and receive the Dharma. And this can act as a trigger uh, to kind of instill the seeds of liberation in their soul, you could say. It kind of perpetuate them to Buddhahood. And so it's seen to be so important. But for Westerners, we have this idea, it's a very worldly idea, we have this idea about retirement, right? And it's not the kind of idea that people really have in the East. If you look at um, Nepal and uh, India, etc., then these people don't really have this notion of retirement. The elderly people in, let's say, Tibetan people, and when they get really old and they can no longer work within the family, and they do keep working. I mean, you'll see the old grandfather sitting there looking after the shop until he's well into his, you know, he's getting really de decrepit. And what they do is when they finally are no, no longer of any kind of practical mundane use to the family, what they do is, is they go out and they do Korah. You know, they spin prayer wheels, say mantras, and try to accumulate some virtue until the day they die. So they just keep going. And they're not like spiritual practitioners. They're not like meditators. But they have great faith in the spiritual path. And they've got the strong feeling that they've just got to do whatever they can do until they die to seek enlightenment. And they're not teachers, so they can't teach others. They're uneducated. But when it comes to these great Dharma teachers, Dilgo, Kienzi, Rinpoche, all these kind of lamas, etc., then their thought is that they just keep going right up until the day they die. I mean, there's another Tibetan uh, lama called uh, Kempo Palga, and he would never live in a house or a home. He would always live in nomadic tents out in the middle of the steppe somewhere, you know, in very harsh conditions. And he just kept teaching and teaching and teaching until he's incredibly old, you know. He lost his hearing. It looks like his eyesight was so bad he could barely see anymore. But it didn't stop him. He still had this kind of compassion for people and his students. And he kept teaching relentlessly and no thought of retirement. I mean, what is retirement anyway? I mean, we kind of have this idea that we work just enough until we save up enough money and we can start thinking about ourselves. We can have a holiday kind of thing. Retirement's kind of like a holiday, right? Well, I worked really hard. I've got so much money here in the bank and now I should use this uh, for just to relax and take it easy until the end of my life. It's that kind of idea, right? It's totally mundane and it's not in any way related to spirituality. So when I heard that this um, Western teacher had decided to retire, I was quite shocked. But it's not unusual. I mean, there is a, a Dharma teacher here in Western Canada I heard of who now feels he's getting a bit old and he should retire and doesn't really teach anymore. So I guess it's quite a common idea in the West. But what I'm saying here is this is not a kind of idea that a spiritual teacher should have, really. But we've got it all the wrong way around, right? Because we see being a spiritual teacher as a job. I mean, when I looked at this, this video, I saw a video of this same teacher. I won't mention his name because people get upset, right? They think, you're, they're, they think you're talking badly about their teacher and they get upset. They get upset because they're not spiritual practitioners. You know, they haven't quelled the fires of their negative emotions. And so they get angry if you even suggest that there's something wrong with their teacher. 
For example, recently I made a few postings about Krishnamurti, and I wasn't really criticizing him. I was just highlighting the different ways that we approach this kind of spiritual path. And I do have a lot of respect for Krishnamurti, even though I don't, I'm not inspired by his teachings in any way. I don't see any kind of special substance there that would benefit me or that I could use to improve my spiritual knowledge and help others. I wouldn't sort of kind of repeat what he had to say to anybody I was instructing because I, I see it to be kind of dead end. But I still have great respect for him. He's incredibly kind of eloquent and intelligent. You know, I respect his intelligence. I respect his eloquence. Uh, and I also kind of respect his kind of historical evolution, you could say. So I heard that this uh, Western teacher had planned to retire soon. And then on YouTube, I saw another one of his videos. It's quite recent where he was giving some of his final instruction. And then I looked at the description on the bottom of this video. And basically it said, this video is free to view for a short time, after which it will only be available for sale on my website. Well, that just answered all my queries, my questions and my doubts. That his feeling that he need to retire was associated with the way that he sees the Dharma. The Dharma is something to be sold, spiritual path, is a kind of means of an income and uh, you know this is just a worldly way of thinking we like being spiritual teachers because it makes us somebody famous and it becomes a source of income and once we've got enough cash in the bank and then we don't need it anymore we can retire to Mexico or something like that and like I said, maybe he wants to practice his own meditation. But even that's not really a very good Dharma motivation. Uh, our own teacher who recently passed away, Tranga Ribeshe, had said that he didn't really respect people who just ran off into the wilderness and abandoned their students in order to practice. But you know, he was talking about people who did go off into the wilderness, who went off into the mountains and kind of cut themselves off from others. That's not an easy thing to do. Imagine what Trang Rinpoche would think about people who decided to retire, you know, and sit in the comfort of their own home and do a bit of shine in the morning. So I don't have a kind of omniscience, so I can't tell what this uh, spiritual teacher plans to do, or what his motivations are. But it sounded very kind of undharma-like to me, uh, and a bit shocking. And basically, I immediately lost any chance of having respect for this Dharma teacher. Especially when I see things like, you know, they're selling their teachings. It's a terrible thing to do. You should, it, I mean, for the Buddhist tradition anyway, you should never sell the Dharma. It seemed to be one of the worst kinds of karma. I mean, there's two. There's the negative karma of abandoning the Dharma. So let's just say, oh, this doesn't work. This is rubbish. This is just, this is all lies, you know. If you have that, that's not good. And it's not good because in future lifetimes, then you will reject the Dharma. You won't meet it. And you have no sort of path to liberation. And the other one is selling the Dharma. And most Western teachers are just doing that. They're just selling the Dharma. Even if they have good motivation, then this wish to sell the Dharma comes from a lack of belief in karma cause and effect. If you believe that teaching the spiritual path to others is beneficial, it's good karma, then naturally that will see you through the hard times. You're not going to have to uh, suffer. It's not going to be too difficult for you. In the end, everything will turn out right. It's if you believe in karma cause and effect. But then if you don't believe in karma cause and effect, then I can see how you might think, well, well, I need some money. I need to sort of pad my pockets a bit because if I'm, if I end up homeless, in the street and I won't be able to benefit others. I, I suppose that's kind of a, a valid way of thinking, if not a very Dharma way of thinking. It reminds me of another story somebody sent, told me recently. He said that there was this student somewhere in Canada, I can't remember where it was, and that everybody thought he had great potential and that he was going somewhere because he dedicated himself so diligently when he was in retreat. But now he's ended up homeless and a drug addict in the street. Now, it is a chance, it is possible that they've become a siddha, and so they just appear to be a beggar or a drug addict to us. It's unlikely, 
I find that very hard to believe. But um, it's one thing you should know. If you're somebody with sort of spiritual accomplishment, then you've got to be better than an ordinary human being. You have to be pretty well sorted out yourself. You have to be kind of extraordinary. You can't be sort of subordinary. In order to be an accomplished master or somebody with spiritual practice, then you've got to kind of be a cut above the rest. So you can't really be suffering from mental illness like drug addiction and depression and that sort of thing. That's, that shows a real lack of understanding about what spiritual practice is, because spiritual practice is this development of kind of insight and wisdom that transcends the world. Uh, like I said, then, you know, advanced spiritual practitioners do look a bit strange to us. You just look at Talopa and Naropa and Melarapa and all these sort of people. They, they look to many to be like beggars or madmen. But... Uh, just because there were these masters in the past, there's no reason to use acting strange as an excuse or to just pretend. That would be a real mistake. Anyway, that's about all I wanted to say. And if you get a chance, then you should sort of look into the life stories of some of these modern masters. I mean, I've mentioned Petro Rimeshe many times, right? Well, his life story is quite extraordinary. And so none of them really had this thought of retirement. Now, who should retire? If you're a spiritual teacher, what is a valid reason to retire? Well, there's one very important valid reason to retire if you're a spiritual teacher. And that's if you realize you've been teaching people a mistaken path. You're a spiritual teacher, you believe in what you're saying, and then suddenly you realize, well, um, what I've been saying is a lot of nonsense and it's not going to help them in any way, then you should definitely retire. You should retire immediately. But if that's not the case, and if you believe that what you're teaching is going to benefit people ultimately, then what reason would there be to retire? And if you've got compassion, bodhicitta, and you're working for the benefit of others, then of course you should keep teaching until the very day you die. So anyway, thank you for listening. Um, nearly fully mended and back to normal and I will try to post another video soon so thank you very much and see you next time